them for them to question each other. We've had over the past few years some great exchanges here, and no doubt we will uh, this year as well. Um, I might say that uh, we feel very fortunate this year, as well as the others, to have been able to bring here uh, the quality of people that we have had. I mean, if you look at the list, it's, it's been, I think, quite, uh, uh, it's been satisfying to us to, to attract the, these people. I uh, want to make a couple announce, a couple acknowledgments uh, to uh, some firms who have helped us through the five years, Skidmore Owings and Merrill Foundation has helped us with the grant that uh, um, provides the edge that's necessary to make these conferences work. And uh, several firms in San Francisco, uh, by registering uh, numbers of people in their office, have helped us as well. Uh, particularly this year, all good Hugh Hayes and Parker, I want to thank them for their uh, contribution. I'd like to introduce the uh, President George Ansovicius of the, the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture. George is the dean at the University of New Mexico, and well, he's well known really everywhere. Uh, he is the new president of AS, ACSA for the next year, and Richard McCommons, the executive director of ACSA. I don't. There you are. Yeah. He'll be glad to enlist members. Uh, now to begin, I. I think we are especially fortunate to have Christian Arbert Schultz uh, come here to lead this symposium. Uh, we had him here two years ago, uh, and I think he raised some, some very provocative issues that we're really following up on today. Christian is well known to all of us as one of the most respected authors and critics and scholars in the world. To my mind, his very special contribution has been the cumulative nature of his work. Book on book, uh, research on research has been, has been building. And uh, I think, at least to my mind, he has developed uh, what is the closest thing we have to a theory of architecture that really explains, uh, helps us explain and interpret the current condition and confusion, perhaps, in the world. Uh, Christian gave a memorable lecture in 1983 here uh, on the theory of place, and that was followed by a lecture titled Place Today, where he tried to ex assess some of the work that uh, was going on in the world in terms of theory of place, his theory of place. Uh, that second lecture, I think, left uh, a lot of questions in many people's minds. Many people uh, asked us to uh, invite him back again to build on top of, of what he had discussed before. So that uh, was really the beginning of this conference. Uh, he agreed to uh, further develop some of his ideas and to uh, explore this topic of figurative architecture. We're happy to have you here to take the lead. Thanks. And thanks to all of you for the invitation to come here. I'm always very happy to visit the United States. I think it is a necessary and valuable correction for us Europeans. Uh, being Europeans, we more than you belong to a kind of special, more limited culture. And I think we tend, therefore, also to be more narrow-minded somehow, at least to look at things from one particular point of view very easily. And to come here, things kind of explode. It is always a kind of frightening experience in a way, very pleasant at the same time. But to come here and suddenly see that kind of everything comes together, always creates a certain confusion in, in one's mind. I wonder always when I come here if what I'm working at is really valid, because it seems that here things are more complex, full of contradictions, almost to quote Bob Venturi. Anyhow, that is also 
the inspiration we need, I think. And just walking around yesterday in downtown San Francisco, I, well, I think I got a few ideas which I will develop maybe the next time I come here. <laughs> Today I shall talk on a subject which I'm working on at present, and I call it figurative architecture. And whatever is that, you might ask. Well, it is not very new. I have always, as Jerry suggested, been kind of following up the same problems. I started out many, many years ago with a book called Intentions in Architecture. And the basic task I put myself at that time was to try to explain meaning in architecture. What is meaningful architecture? Well, you might say architecture is always meaningful somehow. I wanted, though, to get into certain kinds of meaning. And my point of departure was, I think, very early experiences. Uh, experiences I had during the time I was a student in Zürich with Siegfried Gideon. And I mention that because when today I shall talk about an architecture and an approach to architecture which Gideon might not have liked, I don't think that there is a certain continuity present. And the point of departure comes out in Gideon's own words. Already in the 1940s, he published a couple of articles. One had the title on the new regionalism, and I think was published originally in the architectural record. The other one was called the new monumentality both rather dangerous subjects at that time. But Gideon wrote about that already in, 19, in the 40s, during the war, quite incredible. So when I became his student just after the war, we heard about these ideas. We were taught modern art and architecture. And I stress the fact that we were taught modern art, because Gideon used to say, you don't become an architect today without having gone through the need lie of modern art. And I th still think that is right. At the same time, however, he recognized that modern architecture needed a kind of development. And he wrote in 1944, in countries where modern architecture has won the battle, and been entrusted with monumental tasks involving more than functional problems, one cannot but observe that something is lacking in the buildings executed. And this something, he said, is an inspired architectural imagination able to satisfy man's demand for monumentality. The term monumentality is explained with these words. Monumentality springs from the eternal need of people to create symbols for their activities and for their fate or destiny, for their beliefs and for their social convictions. So a new quest for meaning was somehow started at that time. And I think that that quest for meaning has been a very important tendency throughout the post-war years. But at the beginning, we didn't give so much importance to it, perhaps. We did somehow, but it was though generally pushed aside and practical problems become dominant. What Lucan called the measurable became dominant. But I never forget, forgot these, these ideas of Gideon. And studying at Harvard University in 1952-53, I started to approach the problem of meaning. And the result was the book Intentions in Architecture. My 
Ricardo di Pace was psychology and to some extent sociology, which I studied at Harvard. And in the book Intentions in Architecture, I already there talked about what I call the simple milieu. That is an environment consisting of symbolic forms which may satisfy this demand for so-called monumentality. Well, how to do that though, how to make this become concrete was not so easy to say. I went on a few years later with another much smaller book called Existence, Space and Architecture. And there, the approach is somewhat different. Not basically different, I think. The problem is the same. And still I use to a high extent psychology. But the very title, Existence, Space and Architecture, indicates that the approach has become now concerned with man's existence. Well, what is that compared with, say, psychology? Well, it is a wider term. It really relates to how we are in the world in a very complete sense. How we are in the world concretely standing on the ground and moving about and being under a certain sky. Foggy like here in San Francisco or sunny like in some other places. And of course also being with others, being with other people. The whole social dimension is also involved, of course, in this term. So I try to understand space in this sense, not space in a mathematical sense, but space as lived space. And that is something different. Lived space is qualitative. It is not measurable. Well, about that time also, Lucan came to the fore. And we were, many of us, I almost said all of us, very interested in his work and his ideas. So that was another new source of inspiration. And Kahn also, I think, is behind what I'm trying to do today, to some extent. When Kahn asked what does a building want to be, he intended that any building has to possess a kind of identity. It is not just a container. It is not just a kind of abstract pattern. It doesn't only belong to that kind of approach which we in Europe call structuralism, but it has to possess an identity. It has to be something. As Khan himself said, a rose wants to be a rose. So he somewhat suggests that the world we live in doesn't consist really of patterns, that patterns might be useful as tools, but that the world is more concrete. It consists not of atoms and molecules either, but really of the everyday things we are living with. It consists of trees and flowers, mountains, lakes of human beings, <coughs> animals, and certainly also buildings. And these are the kind of things which stand there and with which we have to come to terms. Well, why do I then use the word figure in connection with that? Well, because the identity of a thing, I think, corresponds to its figure of quality. There are many sayings in language which indicate that. You might, I'm not sure if you say in English that one makes a good figure, or you say about the person that this person has a nice figure, and so forth. Anyway, we kind of go with the word figure, intend the characteristic shape of something. Not really the typical shape, because a type is more abstract, more general. A figure is something more concrete, which stands in front of you as something. Well, be, may, maybe as something general, as a tree, or as a bottle, or whatever. 
but though as at the same time an individual free or bottle. Well, this approach then to meaning returns, I should say, to the world of everyday life. And I want to stress that immediately, that I think that is basic. Because abstraction from everyday life has become, I think, the basic disease of our time. We learn to measure, we learn to look at quantities always. But qualities are forgotten. So meaning is first of all concerned with qualities. Well, evidently also modern architecture in its early stage was concerned with meanings. But meanings were somehow restricted. That is, the definition was somewhat restricted. Maybe not really in the thinking and works of the pioneers. I think they had a much wider scope than what came out later. I think it is right to say that modern architecture, at least the dominant kind of modern architecture, which is today often called late modern architecture, somehow degenerated. And I still, and I want to stress that, believe in modern architecture, and I believe in the teaching of the pioneers. But anyhow, a certain development takes place, and as Gideon suggested already, that kind of grew out of the modern movement itself. New regionalism and new monumentality. The need for giving architecture, and that is architecture of our time, roots somehow, and to make it expressive of human life. Well, I shall try to illustrate my present approach with some examples. So may I have the first slide, please? <coughs> well, could you? Yes, thank you. Does that disturb or so right? Well, the picture to the left you might recognize. I don't know though, in the United States things change so rapidly that maybe it doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> but I suppose that the building to the right, the customs house in New York City is still standing there. Instead, the other building to the left may have disappeared from oh, what I know. I show that because it is a slide I took maybe, well, many, many years ago. I don't know exactly when, but many years ago. And it kind of brings out what I would call the loss of figurative quality in late modern architecture. The building to the right is a building which possesses an identity. We may like it or not. And I was taught not to like such buildings. But anyhow, it possesses a kind of presence. It stands there and is something. Good or bad, but it is something. Instead, the one to the left, in a certain sense, is nothing. It is just an abstract pattern. It has no presence, no substance. It is a kind of built diagram, I should say. Well, maybe such diagrams are necessary in our time. And we shall certainly not return to making just buildings like the one to the right hand there. On the other hand, we have to try to understand what this loss of figurative quality means. The picture to the right here, which you might know, suggests that today attempts are made at the recovery of figurative quality. And this combination, say, of a late modern structure with a kind of post-modern structure though poses the problem. I'm not saying now that that is how we should do it. I am in general not using examples as models but to illustrate a problem or a principle. So don't uh, misunderstand me, please. Anyhow, which, what is attempted here is though somehow to relate this building 
to an environment. Here in the United States, you talk about context. And context means, of course, to relate to the surroundings, built surroundings or natural surroundings. But I think it also means something more general. It means, in general, to relate to the ground and to the sky to make the building stand and rise in space again. Of course, this can be approached in many, many different ways, and this is when attempted, which just poses the problem. Well, what then is this problem? Let me now try to approach it in a more systematic manner. First, an indication about what we could call figurative and non-figurative architecture. I am not saying that, that this house to the right in Rotterdam is bad architecture. I think it is a rather pleasant and fine house, which certainly also belongs to the, the good works of the modern movement. But somehow it is rather absent. It lacks what you see in the houses to the left, or the buildings rather to the left. It lacks the quality of elements or parts which you can name, I should say. To the left there you can talk about every part and use the words of everyday language. You can say do. You can say door, window, staircase, or steps, parapet, maybe, and so forth. All the elements there are concrete in the sense that they have names. They belong to the everyday world of human beings, where everything has a name. Instead, the building to the right here is difficult to look at in this way. What shall we call it? We cannot any more use these old words. We try to invent new ones, maybe, and talk about the glass wall, for instance, which is all composed of known words. Another fact about it is that buildings like the one to the right here are not easy to remember. You might remember it and draw it for me probably when you have looked at it. But many of them would look more or less the same. It would not be easy to distinguish one from the other. So they kind of evade memory. They kind of fade away in a certain sense. And that is typical of so much modern art. And this is not, again, an attack on modern art. It is just one of the qualities of modern art, that it is not easily remembered. Think of modern music, for instance. Well, there are certainly elements in it you can remember. But, say, after Schoenberg, music became very difficult to have that relationship to. The music of Anton Weber, for instance, I, although I study music and always live with music, I have very strong difficulties in remembering the music of Weber because it doesn't contain themes or, let us say, melodies which stand out as something you can grasp and keep. That is a parallel, I think, to what happened in a certain sense in modern architecture. And in this context, it is interesting to return to Gideon's talk about the new monumentality. Because he took care to say that with the word monumentality, he didn't mean something big and impressive. He even showed some examples against that, showing an example from, from Russia, from Stalinist Soviet Union and another from, from Nazi Germany and showing that they look more or less the same, the kind of false monumentality. Instead, he said, the very word monumentum means something that reminds. 
So what he aimed at was to return to some or reconquer forms that remind you of something. That is, again, the historical dimension, dimension entered architecture, or at least one hoped that it might again enter architecture. So, of course, that means to work with forms which can be remembered. You cannot remind of anything with forms which cannot be be kept, the melody which can be sung, so to speak, or whistled. Next, please, no. Well, the result we are facing, say, the late modern architecture, which then really abstracts from this concrete reality, from what I here have called everyday life, certainly goes together with certain tendencies in modern art. That is abstraction. That is the departure from what is immediately given. And we all know why that happened. We know there were several reasons for it. One reason was what the same Gideon called the devaluation of symbols. So Gideon said, we had, he said, in modern art, to start all over again from zero, as if nothing had ever been done before. And I'm convinced that that was necessary, and the stage in the development. But if that stage is just kept, or if one develops that side of the problem, then the result might though be a complete abstraction, a kind of environment which really has no presence, no substance anymore, where the figurative quality is really lost. And in fact, late modern art was called non-figurative art. And I have introduced now the word figurative because I want to oppose that, what I consider degeneration of modern art. So our problem then is to try to understand reality in terms of concrete things and also understand how certain figures, certain concrete shapes may help us to come to terms with that reality. And then we might of course again return to psychology, to the development of the child and just quickly point out that the child certainly builds up a world of things. The child doesn't build up a world of abstract relationships. The child doesn't measure. The child is first of all concerned with qualities. Qualities like soft and hard and warm and cold, yes, but always related to concrete things. The quality of heart as such is not understood. But the rock is understood, and the sand, and the water. <coughs> and then a world of things comes into being, and we belong to that, and we live in it. In the past, of course, this world of things was a kind of simple world. It consisted of relatively few things, and these things belonged to a certain place so that it was a word you could really understand in the sense of standing under among these things and participate in this word. Today the word has become extremely complex and we live with things from many places, many times and they are all mixing together. Yesterday, for instance, I had lunch eating Italian food though accompanied by the clarinet concerto of Mozart. And that is what happens today. And that is not necessarily wrong, I think. Only to be able to live with that, we have to understand and be more conscious of what things really are. Well, I cannot develop that now. I can just indicate this problem. And also indicate that, of course, our everyday world consists of larger things, not only of apples and lemons, 
but of mountains and valleys and trees, lakes and so forth. As I said before, everything that has a name is part of this everyday world. Well, then you might, of course, object that the meaning of these things change, that the word tree, so to speak, doesn't really mean anything special, anything particular. We trees are different, and we we react differently to them. Some people like them, and some others not. Well, that is certainly true. On the other hand, a rose wants to be a rose and wants to be understood as a rose. So I am against this total relativism, which is often today being uh, taught. I think that we ought to respect the things and understand them on their terms. And, of course, relate them to our life today, so that our interpretation varies. But our interpretation is not something completely arbitrary. You say in English, for instance, neither fowl nor fish. And that is a good saying, I think. It expresses that something has to be something. It has to be, if it is not fowl nor fish, then it has to be something else, a tree or a dog. Well, of course, to this world also then belongs the humans, and they have names too. And their actions, to some extent, have names too. Because also human life consists of situations which re recur. So also human beings and human life can be named and forms part of the everyday world. And this life takes place, we say. That was a word which I used as the point of departure for my lecture here two years ago, to take place. When something occurs, we say that it takes place. Very important, I think, very illuminating statement, because that means that life and place cannot be separated. When anything happens, it takes place. And it's interesting to see that languages, different languages, have this expression. I cannot say all languages because I don't know all languages. I only know that that expression is there in Italian, in French, in German, in English, and in the Scandinavian languages with slight variations. In English you say take place. In German you say find place. In Swedish you say have place. And, well, slight differences, but basically it expresses this unity of life and place. So when in the conference or the symposium we start today in the title, it is said the loss and recovery of place, then it means that place is part of the problem. When I talk about figurative architecture, I'm first of all concerned about how to recover place. Thinking of architecture and in the term of place making, as Don Linden and others have defined it. Well, place as lived space does not correspond to measurable space or photographic space, say. This example may illustrate that. This painting by Cezanne shows us how Cezanne has modified <coughs> the motif, how he has modified space to bring out the qualitative aspects of it. <coughs> On the left-hand side here, you see Cezanne's painting compared with a photograph of the motif taken from the Weigel book, Cezanne's composition by Earl Lauren, an American. And as we see, Cezanne has done certain <coughs> rather important changes to the things which make up this environment. He has changed the hill in the background and the road leading into space, first of all, and also some other changes if you look more carefully at it. And he has made that hill rise up in space, because what is the quality of a hill? 
what is, if I might use a dangerous word, the essence of the hill? Well, the hill, of course, rises up in space. It is not a depression, it is not flat. It rises up, to say, in Baba way. And we, living in space, we experience that quality. The camera doesn't really grasp it. The hill might be so low that on the picture it doesn't look very interesting. We feel when we are there that it is much more interesting than the, the photographic reproduction can uh, show it. And we change it. So therefore, the painting or the work of art is always an interpretation. It tries to interpret what is there in a qualitative sense and not just depict it in an objective measurement <coughs> sense. And that is how I think we ought to look at architecture too. We ought to understand architecture always as an interpretation, but not as an arbitrary invention an interpretation of something which wants to be understood. Thus, architecture always also consists of things, basically. Architecture is made up of things, among other things. This sketch to the left by Leon Creer might illustrate the point of what is a thing, what does it want to be. Could this be a coffee pot? Or could this be a bottle? Bottles and coffee pots are not the same. Today we tend to mix up these things. It is fine that we drink French wine in another country, but therefore we don't have to mix up coffee pots and bottles. And when we look at Aldo Rossi's drawing to the right here, then he probably wants to tell us that the forms of architecture also ought to have this quality, this identity of the thing. They stand there and have an identity. And architecture becomes then a universe of things or figures. We can say types which are always interpreted in a certain way and therefore appear as a concrete figure. Types, in a certain sense, do not exist, but figures exist as interpretations of types. And this, of course, means that life, everyday life, possesses a kind of order, an intrinsic order, as I also said before. A complex order which in many ways change, but also where something remains. What remains and what changes? It's a difficult philosophical problem, and I shall not go into it more now. I should just say that something certainly remains. And that is good, because then we can also today, to some extent at least, enjoy and understand the works of the past folk cultures or of high cultures from other parts of the world or other times. Well, another two drawings by Creer suggest then that the architectural universe of concrete things has to be understood in certain terms. We it is not enough just to point out that architectural things are there. And he tries to do it in a little text he published recently in the architectural design in a special number dedicated to his work with three drawings of which I show the two. The one to the left, the public institutions, which appear as very distinct shapes in the environment distinct figures, having a very clear uh, uh, identity. And then, in the middle between these two, the simple domain of dwellings, of the private or communal dwellings, which then kind of constitute the more general background, the more general pattern 
on which these public institutions stand forth. And when you combine them then, what results the Chivitas is then like that. Well, Creer is, I think, quite right here when it concerns settlements of the past. This was mostly true. It was like that. And many old cities are still like that. He ought, of course, maybe also to introduce the importance or to make us note the importance of the spaces between these elements. The spaces where, for instance, public life takes place, or communal life takes place. But though, in a very, I think, clear and interesting way, he presents to us a basic fact of the lived environment. The question then arises whether this is possible today or if it has basically changed. I think it has to some extent changed. Public buildings are no longer dominant as they were in the past, for instance here in Bern. Public buildings are today maybe smaller Try to make it in focus here, but it doesn't move. Um, and the whole relationship between private and public is not the same as in the past. So we cannot just take the career drawing as a model and say that is how we ought to build our cities today. The problems are more complex than that. But we can go learn something from it. We can also use this as a point of departure for thinking about the environment, the built environment, and its constituent parts. And I have tried to approach that problem now in a little book which is just out. That is, I don't know if it is yet in the bookstores, but I have got the first copy here. And there I try to approach the problem of meaning, the problem of the meaningful environment in terms of dwelling. The book is here called The Concept of Dwelling and is published by Rizzoli in New York. Well, why do I do that? Well, going back to what I said before, in Intentions in Architecture, I thought in terms of psychology. And in existence space and architecture, well, more or less the same, though going into a kind of different approach to psychological problems. In the concept of dwelling, I go a little further without leaving that, that dimension behind. But now trying to understand our being in the world in terms of dwelling. <coughs> And not just say that man dwells in the sense of belonging to a place, more or less, maybe moving around, leaving the place, returning to it, or having a set of different places and so forth. But trying to relate that also to society. And then some interesting things come out, I think, which might be a good way of understanding the problem of meaning. Well, first of all, let us look at two pictures which indicate that the forms or figures we are surrounded by are meaningful. To the left we have a tower which rises up in the forest. Well, what is that? Well, we would say that is a castle or a fort. And there's a, what, what is it in existential or human terms? Well, what should one answer? I would personally say, well, it is a place of arrival, a possible place of arrival. I passed by that tower driving a car once and stopped and took a picture of it. I didn't approach it, I didn't go inside it, and still it was there as a possible place of arrival. It was a point in space, it gold. And it illustrates what a work of architecture ought to be, a possible place of arrival. 
and at the same time, of course, of departure. Our life is always related to places of departure and arrival. We come there, we go there, we go somewhere to look at it, to meet people, to do a certain work. And to allow that to happen, the place has to possess such a figure of identity. You have to know that you arrive and experience that you arrive, and it has to be a point in space. Well, certainly in the modern cities, it's not as simple as that, but anyway, I think that is still valid, basically. The picture to the right instead shows us how such forms might have a more particular meaning, how they might become symbols. These are small objects which were put up outside the Etruscan tombs. I do not know if the Etruscans always did that, but at least in Cerveter, in near Rome, they did. And for each man who was buried in the tomb, they put up this uh, such a small common, evidently a phallic symbol. And for each woman who was buried in the tomb, they cut up, put up a little house. Very nice, very well, I think illuminating to our problem. How a built form, how a thing might mean something and kind of stand there and tell us something we ought to know. Well, how then does this relate to dwelling? Well, I would say that there are evidently certain basic types which relate to different basic modes of dwelling. There are certain types and thus figures which are figures of private dwelling, figures of communal dwelling, and figures of public dwelling. In my book, I have distinguished between three basic kinds of dwelling, or modes of dwelling, as I say. And I think that may help us a little to understand the environment and also to plan it. Uh, as human beings, we live with others. We meet others and we communicate with others. Sometimes we agree with others. And then we also want to withdraw from the others. We want also to be on our own and have what we call a private life. So also the function of withdrawal is essential, as the function of meeting is essential. And the forms of withdrawal, then, is evidently connected with the private dwelling, with the house. Today, of course, houses don't look like that. So I don't mean that we now return to these kind of houses. We cannot do that. We can, though, keep the house alive somehow, as a house. Even maybe keep alive the qualities, the basic figure qualities of the house in a large apartment building. There are, I think, basic figures of private dwelling. And the roof is one of them. The embracing protective roof, which gives a sense of shelter. That has always been so. That doesn't mean that all houses have to possess such a roof. There are other ways of resolving the problem too. Another form, another basic figure or type which sets private dwelling into work, makes it a concrete fact, is the interior, the hall, the large room around which the dwelling organizes itself. The British architect Bailey Scott, he describes that very beautifully in his book, Houses and Gardens, which was published in London, I think, in 1903 or four or something like that where he says that any house, any dwelling, has to have a home, he says. This communal space in the middle, which really constitutes a center, and onto which all the other rooms kind of relate. So these are basic <coughs> forms of private dwelling. 
you could mention the Pompeian atrium house as another example and so forth. <coughs> While showing Palladius the Rotonda to the right here, in connection with that peasant house from the Black Forest, I just want to indicate that that also somehow satisfies the basic forms of private well although it is also something more evidently or at least interprets that in a kind of wider set of references than maybe the peasant house to the left does i cannot go into that in detail now just want to point out with these two examples that private dwelling has certain basic forms and then also the communal or collective dwelling, as I call it in my book, also has certain basic forms. And what do I mean with that? Well, this is the function I call the meeting, that human beings come together and need to come together for obvious reasons. But the important point here is to understand that when we meet and come together, we do not necessarily have to come to an agreement. We are different, and meeting really preserves our differences. If not, it wouldn't really be any meeting, in the sense that we need others to learn from them. And if they were exactly alike, then we wouldn't gain anything new. So meeting is first of all based on dissimilarity, and therefore, the forms of meeting should be fairly free in a certain sense. The Campo in Siena is an enclosed space. It is a piazza. But it is not strictly symmetrical. It is not a space expressing a particular agreement, I should say. It leaves you free somehow because of its, what I would call, topological shape. Well, it contains also elements expressing an agreement, like the city hall with its tower. And the tower stands there to mark that here a community has its center, where people meet and come together. So space and build form here work together to express this function of meeting. Well, it is of course interesting to know that the city hall also contained the city council where the members were elected uh, in a really democratic way in the 14th century that any male citizen had to take upon himself the duty of being a member of it if he was elected. Anyway, my point again is that there are forms of what I call communal dwelling that is often forgotten today. Piazzas are made, or urban spaces, in a too special, in a too um, de determined way, so that they rather express a particular kind of agreement. Because there is a third basic mode of dwelling, which I have called public dwelling. I do not know if these words are chosen very well, but I think communal dwelling, though, uh, or rather collective dwelling, expresses the fact of just a collection of people, people gathering, whereas public dwelling expresses the fact of a common agreement. And common agreements have always been made visible, made manifest in terms of public buildings which, because they represent an agreement, and that is a particular understanding of the word, have to have a more precise, a more distinct form than the forms of collective dwelling, than the piazza and the street. So when we enter then one of these public buildings, it might be a church or a mosque or a city hall, or there might be other possibilities, we experience that here this common world to which a certain community belongs uh, is explained to us. Here architecture becomes explanation, I should say. It is no longer just a question of a functional container 
but it is an explanation of a certain understanding of the world. It makes it become manifest, it stands there, and therefore becomes also a goal to those people who belong to this world. Well, you might say that this is, though, again, the past. Today we have many different words. We have almost as many words as there are human beings, although we tend, though, to still join up in groups and, and have certain agreements with a smaller or larger number of other people. Well, certainly in the modern environment, in the modern city, we we have many such buildings of different kinds, but they all serve as explanations. In a complex pluralistic society, we will see that there are different interpretations of life who, which live together, but somehow they all don't have to be expressed. If not, they fade away. They have to be kept in terms of built forms or figures which stand here so that we can say now we are here. Well, these were what I have called in my book the modes of dwelling. But we can then also look at the matter in a somewhat more general theoretical way and say what is common then to the different forms which satisfy the modes of dwelling. And then we come back to the well-known concepts of space and built form. And that is necessary because when we have to understand and compare and distinguish between the figures which express the different kinds of dwelling, we need to think in terms of space and built form. And of course also there, there are some basic structures, some basic I would rather call it qualities, which have been used over and over again throughout history in ever new combinations. And basically these structures are the center and the path. I've talked about that also two years ago and shall not repeat myself here now. I just want to remind of that. And that center and path have always been used in a meaningful way. Certainly not always, but at least mostly when has managed to use them in a meaningful way. Like, for instance, here in the original Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, in the reconstruction of Kenneth Conant, where you see that the tomb is a centralized space. The tomb where life has come to an end, of course, has to be a space without direction without dynamism, it has to be a static resting space. Whereas the church is a longitudinal space, it is based on a path from one place to another, with a space which has a goal, because it represents the path of life, what is before the tomb. And as you also all know that the baptistry in Christian churches where was usually placed at the entrance, maybe in front of the entrance, and was also a centralized structure. So you see from one static resting form, which so to speak represents what is before life, you move along the path of life and then the whole thing comes to a conclusion. This just to illustrate how spatial patterns or forms have been used meaningfully and one could take any culture and find the same or corresponding things. Well, space, of course, can then be subject to composition and form very complex organisms of different kinds. To the left here, uh, you have Santo Spirito by Brunelleschi on the top, of which is not shown, doesn't matter. And you have Ramantes project for the cathedral in Pavia below. And you see how from the simple question of center and path, how complex organisms of directions and centers have been created through a particular kind of composition which has been 
denominated additive composition. Instead, in Baroque architecture, such organisms are set into motion somehow. They are not basically different. You still have centers and parts, and you still have a certain symbolism um, which remains, of course, from there to there. But a new idea of the world has entered the picture. The idea of a dynamic open world, as was expressed by Guarini in one of his philosophical works, where he says that throughout the world, throughout nature, I think he says, there goes an undulating movement, a movement of expansion and contraction. And this dynamic interpretation then, that things are not static, just standing there, but really are dynamic, and there is a kind of breathing in and out in the world, so to speak, is then expressed in the plan of these buildings, where each second element expands and contracts. This one expands, and because of that, that one has to contract, to give in, and the other one expands again, so that, that you you get the kind of pulsating effect. And th that is actually the word used by Guarini. He said, a pulsating movement goes through the whole of nature. And here you could add more of these elements if you wanted. These dotted lines indicate that you could go on, not everywhere, along certain directions. You could add more elements and go on ad infinito. It could become a city which pulsates, if you want. And in Rome, in Piazza Sant'Ignazio, that possibility is really built. There you have several spaces which interact in that way. Then it stops, but it could have gone on. Well, this just to indicate that, of course, the composition of space is a particular more abstract or general problem which we can learn and which we can then use according to our needs. But it somehow goes together with the question of figural quality. In both cases here the elements have a figural quality and also the total organism made up has a figural quality. That is, it stands there as a certain thing you can grasp and remember. The other side of the medal then, the built form, as we all know, of course, also has basic properties. And strangely enough, although that is so evident and so basic, it was somehow forgotten, at least in much of late modern architecture that a form stands on the ground and rises up in space was neglected to some extent. There was no difference between up and down anymore. So we ought to return to understand that. Not necessarily to make static forms which stand here. We could also make an inverse of that and contradict it, but that you can only contradict something if you first know what it is. So also the built form, we have to recover somehow and understand that there is a difference between up and down. And throughout the history of architecture, then we see how that has become a basic fact in architectural expression. I show now mostly examples from churches. It is, of course, not my intention to give a lecture on church architecture. I'm talking about general facts. But these problems come up particularly clearly in, in, in uh, certain churches. And you see from the left here, Santa Sabina from the 5th century to Santivo from the 17th century, that, well, basically, there are always the two same spheres or domains, the earthly one and the heavenly one, which are interrelated. The earthly one down here being rather dark and having um, body, having substance through these anthropomorphic columns. The upper one being lighter and 
let us say, to some extent, dematerialized. And in Boromini's church, the two are put in interaction. Again, a kind of pulsating, or at least interactive movement unites the two spheres here. But basically, they are still there. The pilasters down here, and the light, the dome of the sky up there. So that we still recognize the difference between up and down. There is a quotation which I think I probably also used when I was here two years ago, but which illustrates that point. A German writer, Erich Kestner, said in one of his books that even those who do not any longer believe in heaven and hell must though recognize the difference between down and up. <laughs> and many are, they seem to have forgotten that. They design buildings which could be put upside down without seeing the difference. <laughs> well, there are, of course, then also in the built form, the elements which make, let us say, a horizontal movement present not just the rising up in space or standing in space, but also the horizontal movement of opening and closing, which is just as important, of inside and outside. This we all know too. And still we tend in though to lose these figures which express that. When I went to school, it was forbidden to design a window in the wall. That is true. It was forbidden. And, well, I understand why. It was a certain logic in forbidding that, because we were working with an open plan, the free plan. And, of course, a window is a hole in the wall. You kind of stop the movement. And then you make a hole to look out over kind of, well, it doesn't somehow combine with the free plan, at least in its kind of heroic interpretation. So I understand why we did that, but in doing that we lost so very much. We lost all these very sensitive and fine distinctions between outside and inside. <laughs> the control of light, the possibility of looking out and maybe looking in, of not looking out but letting light come in and so forth. And even to express the quality of light in its different uh, modes. This is a very rich and fine example of a window in Venice where you see really this is a kind of poem around the window I should say. Closing, opening, combined with the balcony where you can go up and so forth. I don't have to explain it to you. That speaks for itself. Well, now, I have, after having talked about the modes of dwelling and just asserting that certain figures which make the modes of dwelling manifest exist, I have said a few very general words about space and built form, just to make us remember that we again have to think about that and to know what it means. Then, is that enough? Is it enough to understand architecture in terms of up and down, outside and inside? As we, though, even during the modern movement, to some extent understood. I think it is not enough. I think what I started saying, talking about figurative elements, that certain forms appear as something more than just an element in a composition. They stand out as very particular shapes, which have reoccurred over and over again throughout history with variations. And there are many such forms. The dome is one, the arch is one, the gable is one. And I just show this to illustrate that. I show this front of a little chapel which is no longer existing actually and still that front stands there with its pediment and its round window and its door and its arch over it and is something it stands there and means something in space although it doesn't serve any function anymore it somehow expresses basic facts about being in space being between earth and sky and this theme, then, of a gable or pediment has been used 
in a very interesting way in this project by Olbrich, the house which was built actually. Um, the Three Gables House it was called and it was standing in Darmstadt until the Second World War when it was destroyed by bombing. Uh, here Olbrich has joined three apartments in one house and to give each of them an identity he has made three variations on the gable here you are in a way in the middle of the two others this one reminds us of the embracing enclosing roof of the peasant house I showed before this one instead is a kind of classical resting foot. It's a little more pointed than a classical pediment, but anyhow, it has not a particular vertical or horizontal direction. It doesn't really, well, it embraces, yes, but at the same time, it just stands there in space. Whereas this pointed one then rises up dynamically towards the sky. And in the executed uh, work, it was even made more, let us say, with curved shapes, more dynamic, with scrolls down here and then moving up. Very interesting way of showing what is an architectural figure. These are three interpretations of a theme, I should say. The type, the basic theme is the game. And the gable is interpreted then in three different ways, and we all understand then that these three interpretations are not just whims. They tell us something about possibilities of dwelling, I should say. We might choose the one or the other according to how we are or how is the place we live in. In some places, maybe this one would fit better. In some places, maybe in that one. And in fact, when you travel around in Europe and look at peasant houses and urban houses from the past, you find that certain solutions are selected and are repeated, although varied within certain limits. This can, of course, again be varied in many, many different ways. And why? Well, I think usually because of the environment the given natural environment, basically the place. The place demands a certain interpretation of the type. And of course also related then to human actions and so forth. Well, these basic forms then can take the shape, say, also a complete little image of the world, an imago mundi, as this chapel in Gölgersdorf in Austria, a four-poster, which here serves as a chapel. Charles Moore has used the four-poster to make a little bathroom for himself in Orinda. And then uh, <laughs> putting a sunken bathtub between these four uh, posts. So it is a kind of basic figure and form which can serve several purposes. <laughs> And I wouldn't say it is wrong to use it as a bathroom. You should just not use exactly that one probably for a bathroom. You should do something to it. Well, in any case, in all these cases, we are though back to, as this illustrates what I call an image of the world. All these forms I have shown, all these basic figures, be they details or larger holes, they somehow express our being between earth and sky. And therefore I show this project by Boulet, which illustrates that basic fact. Boulet called this the temple of reason. It should kind of substitute the cathedrals of the past and instead serve as an image of the understood world about the time of the French Revolution. And what did he do? Well, he went down into the ground. He showed the earth as rocks, ravines, caves, what is under the surface on which we live. And over it, he showed the dome of the sky. And between human life, he represented by anthropomorphic columns standing there. So in a kind of rather large nut shape, he shows us what it means to be between earth and sky. 
And I think there are the basic facts which are behind the meaning of architectural forms. Architectural forms stand in space between earth and sky. And according to how they behave, how they stand and rise, how they open and close, how they form a whole, they become expressive of a certain understanding of this world. An understanding which is not completely different. Something remains, but always something changes. What then are these figures, one could ask, and I shall just briefly say that there are many interpretations of that. In modern semiology, it is said that all forms are signs. Then some others say that forms are symbols. Well, I have talked about something slightly different. I think that the semiological theory is not really very fruitful in relation to works of art or architecture. Um, when Bernini puts up this rock here on the Montecitorio Palace, it is not a sign, certainly. It might be called a symbol, yes. It reminds you of something. It reminds you of the rocks around Rome, in the ravines of the valleys around Rome, and which were certainly present along the Tiber at the time of Bernini's, and which again appear in the Trevi fountain here. It reminds us of a certain element of nature, and of Roman nature. So it makes the building belong to this place in a certain sense. So it is, we could say, a symbol. And when we then also see how, for instance, Giuliano da San Gallo applies pilasters to that very, in a way, rough construction of the church in Prato, then what does it do? Well, it is not the sign again. It is, well, it signifies maybe something, but it though is first of all an image of an understood word, as is also this instrumentation, say, of the Campidoglio in Rome by Michelangelo. Well, this is a difficult problem, which I'm going to treat in more detail at another occasion. I just want to point it out now because so much is today written on semiology in connection with architecture. I will just quote the German philosopher Gadamer, who in his very important book, Truth and Method, says, the difference between image and sign has an ontological basis. The image is not limited to an indicative function, as is the sign but forms by its own being part of what it represents. A symbol also does not simply indicate, but presents when it represents. To represent means to bring into presence something which is absent. Bringing into presence something which is absent. Like in the last pictures, Bernini and his followers brought into presence, say, um, no, excuse me, uh, Roman nature. I have talked about something different. I have talked about images. I call it figures, to use a kind of more concrete word. And an image, he says, God, represents through itself through the increase in meaning it brings about. That is, it brings an increase of meaning about by making a, an understood world visible. It makes a world we live in have understood and participate in visible, fixing it and placing it here in front of our eyes. And I think that explanatory function of architecture is still very important. Well, this just in parentheses. Of course, all we then do with these forms and figures depends upon where we are and how we are. But the types are there as possibilities. They do not exist in the stand of being there, they have to be taken from somewhere and placed in front of us as an interpretation. 
as for instance here in the Alhambra, again archetypes are interpreted. It is all there, the earth and the sky, the column and the vault. But here it is interpreted related to the light of the desert, I should say. <coughs> Here, that light which really penetrates and makes matter, so to speak, dissolve. Well, one could say more about that, but I've already spoken too long, so I have to go on to conclude. What happened now? Well, back to our time, although we have always been concerned with our time. Because what I've been talking about, I think, is somehow timeless. But back to examples from our time. And, strange, this picture was normal before. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh. Thank you, that's very good. Well, this is again a church. I've taken so churches as examples today to create a kind of continuity. It is a church designed by the German architect Rudolf Schwarz in, in Aachen, in Germany, in the 1920s. And I think it is a good work of architecture. I find it is very, it has very fine qualities to it. And it, though also, at the same time, reminds you of these basic archetypes. There is a difference between down and up here. The floor is solid stone, the benches are of dark wood, you rise up in this white space from where light comes high up and then comes further down here at the altar, as if life there approaches the earth. And in the exterior you have a bell tower, yes, you have even a little gable up there. It is out of the unfortunately shown, yeah, you might recognize it. So you see how even here, basic types are behind, but they are almost not recognizable anymore. They are, but almost, just, just, well, almost nothing, but enough to give it meaning, though. But of course, this very ascetic architecture could not last, in a way. This is again a complex problem. And as it degenerated, especially after the Second World, these memories, though, of the basic structures of being in the world were really forgotten, as I showed in the very first picture from New York. And as a reaction to that, we experienced <coughs> then an attempt at recovering these qualities again. And we experienced what we call neo-expressionism, where the forms became, again, very strongly expressive, which got a new presence again. And in Le Corbusier's Ronchamp, certainly, the archetypes are again somehow present. Again, the difference between down and up, inside and outside, the hovering roof, like a veil which has come down and rests on the thick, massive walls and so forth. And even the more general shapes of the bell tower to the left and so forth. But these attempts were too special, too unique. It is there in a way, but the interpretation is so unique that one couldn't go on. It did not open up the possibilities of a kind of new architectural language, or rather a new interpretation of the language of architecture. So somehow this couldn't, well, it was not the sole use. What then has happened afterwards, we all know. We know this quest for meaningful forms. And we see how Liu Kang then returned to identifiable forms, how he here uses again the triangle, but not abstractly, but now really as a kind of gable or pediment, and the round window reminding of certain forms of the past and also of something timeless, and that strange bell tower in the middle, different from anything we have ever seen before, though also reminds us somehow. 
it is a different approach, I should say. There is a kind of qualitative change here, I think. And this is, of course, now not to criticize Le Corbusier's Ronchamp, which is a wonderful work. But what I want to suggest is only that it is unique, whereas here something comes about, and also here in the Kimple Museum and in all the other works of Kahn, which opens up a path towards figurative architecture. It opens it up again. After that, many have tried to go on and to kind of carry on that direction with more or less success. The Italian Aldo Rossi, the wrong Aldo, so to speak, he has tried to interpret this problem in terms of typology, strict typology. And as you probably have understood from my talk, I think typology is necessary. There is no language or architecture without typology. But as I said before, the types do not exist. They have to be interpreted and transformed into concrete figures. And that he doesn't do. He builds the types. And the result is a very abstract architecture, again, abstract in a different way from the functional diagrams of late modernism. But though very abstract to my mind, maybe you disagree with me, but that is at least how I see it. And when I visited this cemetery in Modena last summer, I personally found it was rather sterile. I, of course, when I took that picture, tried to make it look as bad as possible. <laughs> well, anyhow, I think there is something basically wrong here, and that is why I took the liberty to do that. I think that Rossi, well, he has pointed out there is the need for typology, but he has understood that the type is an abstraction and we have to make it concrete by building it here and now and giving it an interpretation in connection with this place and this time, somehow. Well, Robert Venturi has approached similar problems and he has gone maybe then in the opposite direction of Rossi. He has also work with types, but then put, first of all, emphasis on the variations, on the possibility of making figures out of a type. Here a gateway, or uh, what we shall call it, has been, for instance, interpreted in very, very many ways. And he has had lots of fun doing that, certainly, and I think it is rather charming and interesting what he does. But beware, one could say, of just making architecture into a game with such possible interpretations. When though he builds, I think he very often and maybe mostly succeeds in making a strong statement that is a building which knows what it wants to be. Like this house which rises up like a kind of tower at the same time with a protective embracing roof and that large window letting light in. There are many basic forms present there, interpreted in a way which we have never really seen like that before. It is, as he says himself, new and old at the same time. And then in the work of Michael Graves, we also see similar attempts. And I show this example here to suggest that I find Graves' work important because he, though somehow, have, has absorbed the teaching of modern art, I think. I think he has basically gone through that needle eye of modern art he have talked about. And therefore his works do not, they are not being trapped like those of Rossi in, in empty schematism. Uh, one could of course discuss that in detail. I cannot do it now as time is out. But I just want to, with these two words, to su suggest what I mean. And then in this drawing to the left, where Graves, which Graves put as an introduction to his collected works about three or four years ago when it was published, he makes then a drawing which is a kind of catalog, so to speak, of architectural figures. 
not just types, it is already somehow interpreted. It is graces, and it is interpreted. And he puts up here everything he thinks that he needs to make a meaningful environment, placing them within a landscape which also consists of concrete figure shapes, like the mountain, like the plain, the valley, the trees, and the cloud. So he aims evidently here at what we might call the figurative architecture. And in fact, the title he put over the text, he wrote to this drawing, he called a case for figurative architecture. <coughs> this doesn't mean that I necessarily think exactly in the same way, but I found that text of Grace very inspiring and uh, found that he there hinted about something essential at the present. And to the right here then, again, and he writes under that drawing, Rome 1980. Instead, this is Rome maybe 1380 or 1280 or something. And you see it's surprisingly similar in a way. You see also at that time how man thought of his environment in terms of architectural things or figures which constituted then a whole. Of course, here also shown as a kind of inventory, but basically though suggesting the same approach, the same and the diff and different, new and old. Well, there are dangers. There are two dangers. There is the danger of being too abstract. To the left we see Le Corbusier also once made a kind of similar drawing. And he then told us that what is hidden within these figural forms are the platonic solids. He reduced it to, say, geometry. And I think that is to go too far. And that was, I think, one of the failures of modern architecture to think in two abstract terms. Le Corbusier didn't do it in his own work. He was a great artist and he followed certainly his feelings just as much as his intellect. But the theory that we could reduce architecture to geometry though was rather common. And his drawing supported it. And I think that is one danger. The other danger is, of course, what happened in, for instance, in the Soviet Union under Stalin that you make a kind of pastiche. And this balance then between abstraction and pastiche is very hard. It is very hard, very dangerous, but that is the balance which is asked for uh, from us today, to be able to do that. And, well, some try and some manage. I think it is a very good moment at present. I think very much significant work is done. I shall not show any examples because I don't want to say that one thing is better than the other. Or maybe they are and maybe I know it, but I don't <laughs> be silent about it. Uh, anyway, that is, I think, needed from us. And just to conclude, I would say that what I tried here to explain as the figurative dimension of architecture, I consider the common denominator of what is today called postmodernism. We might like that word or not, but anyway it aims at again making an architecture which consists of concrete figures which make up an environment which allows life, everyday life, to take place. Thank you.